welcome to the Mansfield Matters podcast, the show for the fans, by the fans. The season is, well, a long thing in our memory, really. So we're here, week, what are we, week four now of the Mansfield Matters, yeah, the trip four. down memory lane podcast, where we're here in the Capo Lounge once again. Cam's back. Yeah, they don't look too happy about that at all, do they? <laughs> um, behind the camera, so uh, hello to Cam and welcome back. Uh, thank you to all of you for all of the fantastic messages so far for all of the uh, shows that we've had so far. They've been absolute corkers and no doubt that uh, this week's is going to be an absolute belter. If you've only just started watching the A Trip Down Memory Lane series, don't worry, you can catch up. They're all on our Facebook page and you can get them on iTunes as well if you want to listen to the audio version on the go. Um, we're here at the Capo Lounge, as I say, in Mansfield and Stockwell Gate in Mansfield. Thank you very much for them for their hospitality and we are of course raising money for the Alzheimer's Society so if you want to donate make sure you do just one pound can make a massive massive difference all the links that you need are in the video description before we introduce and speak to uh, this week's guest let's go to uh, Simon and to Nathan who are with me once again Guide Soccer Hudson is, at, is asleep actually at the uh, feet of our guest today so he's made a friend uh, already um, Simon and Nathan it's been fantastically well received so far the episodes which have uh, gone out as we speak uh, on this Wednesday the Bobby Hassel episode has just gone out I think personally next week's episode which would have been last week's episode of uh, uh, Mickey Baldy is going to be an absolute corker that was a great down Saturday wasn't it? Nice. Yeah well um, I think it was uh, it was a bit of a change for us as well because obviously we've done all the uh, recording so far here at Capo Lounge which has obviously been great but um, Bobby said in his uh, in his interview if anybody watched that he said uh, when we go to Mickey's house he said you'll definitely go into the biggest house in Sheffield and he wasn't wrong it was a beautiful place and it was a very uh, you know brilliant insight into Mickey's career and he's a really nice bloke wasn't he really welcoming and uh, you know I thoroughly enjoyed the day yeah, gave yeah. us a signed shirt as well, which was uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You enjoyed it, didn't you, Cyrus? Yeah, day trip out. Have you looked at a crisp packet in the same way yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no one we'll tell you later, we'll tell you later. <laughs> but, you know, thanks to Mickey for letting us into his own. You know, we all really appreciate that and, you know, making us feel welcome. Indeed. Now, let's turn our attentions to this week. Nathan, this is uh, a player who... I get the feeling personally, had he not sort of departed when he did and not got his injury and sort of decided to go down the part time, it would probably still be in the centre of midfield for the Stags. This player defines the term clubman, doesn't he? Absolutely. Um, you know, you can look at a few, there's, there's only really a handful of players that you can look back on in this last sort of, uh, you know, 10, 15 years where you think, you know, they were, that was the sort of player that would give everything for Mansfield Town and. Uh, you know, the, the, the player we, we have today was, was absolutely one of those and uh, like I say, I'm pretty sure he could probably still do a job for us in midfield so it's a shame, you know, um, he wasn't there to see out the career with us but, um, you know, he's one of those players that we can look back on and think, you know, well, thank him for, for everything they did do. Simon, yeah. when this player arrived from Manchester City on an initial one month loan, I don't think any of us thought that he ended up staying for as long as he did but I think we're all grateful that he did, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, most definitely. Quality player, to be honest. Skillful, you know, hard working, um, just what we needed at the time to be honest and just echo what Nathan said, you know, we could do with him now to be honest. I'm certainly <laughs> well. In a way he's still playing for Mansfield but AFC Mansfield, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously uh, with a few ex stags in there as well. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome to the Capo Lounge uh, tonight uh, John Delarie, JD as yes. uh, we're going to affectionately call you, the original JD, John Dempster tried to nick the title off you but the original uh, JD. Thanks very much for joining us uh, tonight, No problem not too all. far for you to come either because ever since you departed you've stayed local and you've built a life in, in the area haven't you? Yeah yeah I definitely have whilst I was um, still at Stags I started my degree um, in sports science initially with a view to possibly become a PE teacher and when I finished the degree I took up the opportunity that Selston High School gave me became a PE teacher there and, and I've actually changed career and now I'm a maths teacher so um, I enjoy Pipe down Cam I know what you're going to say <laughs> <laughs> I actually enjoy the more academic side of school to be honest so maths um, definitely is good if, if I want to put my shorts on and go outside the PE team let me but I'm strictly suit and tie at the minute but yeah still still local in the area I can't quite imagine him in suit and tie can you? <laughs> not really no <laughs> oh, I should have I should have wore it today but I thought, no, I'll, I'll get changed for a t-shirt oh bless you uh, well obviously let's 
we're going to be talking about a lot of things okay. over the next uh, hour or so here on the Mansfield Matters Memory Rain uh, pass, uh, podcast. I can't get my words out tonight. It's one of <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's go back to the, the very start. Obviously, okay. as I said earlier, initial one month loan from Manchester City. When you got the call to come on loan to the Stags, did you ever think that you'd end up staying and building a life? in this area in, in the way that you have done and now to be honest um at the time i think i was i was 20 years old i'd i'd made my debut in the first scene for man city under kevin keegan um and when he got sacked stuart pierce just said to me listen go out go out there's a team that wants you go and play some games then come back and we'll see we'll see what happens and and i thought yeah i want to i want to play i want to play some matches and um, so i asked what team he told me mansfield town and he said they're in league two I was like, yep, great. What he didn't tell me is that they were bottom of League 2 okay. and about uh, five points adrift of everyone. So I thought, I'm going to take the challenge anyway. And, and yeah, ended up signing and, and obviously built up a massive, massive rapport with the fans, with the players and ended up settling here um, myself. But absolutely no regrets. I loved it. Definitely my favourite club that I've been at was Mansfield Town. Fantastic. And uh, it was a, a loan, initial one month yep. loan spell, then it got extended, yep. then it got extended again, and then it nearly didn't happen that you didn't return yeah. to Mansfield. So what happened? It was strange. So, as you said, we had the one month, got extended again, got extended for the third time, and then I think at the time you could only do a three month loan before it became till the end of the season. So, when that three months ran out, uh, Mansfield Town asked City, can we extend it till the end of the season? And City said no, which in a way, I didn't mind because it made me think they must have Man City must have plans for me and as much as, as I enjoyed my time at Mansfield the opportunity to play at that level you can't really turn it down um, so I went back to City I think within two days I got called back into Stuart Pearce's office and said and he said we've received a bid uh, from Mansfield Town and we've decided to accept it and obviously I, w I was happy that they were interested but I thought you've not let me go back on loan which made me think you want me to stay but now you've turned down a bid and they were a premiership club so I'm not, I don't think they needed the money that it was uh, that Mansfield Town they offered. Might have done in them days, well they might have, yeah <laughs> yeah they, yeah they might have done in those days but I remember going home speaking to my dad and I just said to him Mansfield Town want me and Manchester City have said yes so my dad gave me the best advice he said go and play just go and play because if, if you if you're good enough, you will end up playing higher. And I, and I really did enjoy my time at, at Stags when, when I was on loan. We managed to push well away from the relegation zone and there was a good group of young players mixed with a few experienced players. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna sign. So sign my contract and I think I ended up signing another two or three after that. Um, and yeah, that's how, it, that's how it all came about, really. Yeah, and obviously you were there at a time when Keith Haslam was the chairman. We've spoken about yeah. it quite a lot on the yeah. podcast. Due to the players we've, we've had, we've had stories from Ian Bowling in episode one talking <laughs> about how the players actually once conned him in a car park over wages. <laughs> Anything like that when you were there or was yeah. a bit reserved? I actually saw that bit um, that Ian said. But um, I do have a story, but not quite as dramatic as that. Um, when I was on loan, Simon Brown, um, the strike, one of the strikers at the time, he, he told me, just be careful when you're signing your contracts, make sure everything is as you've agreed. Um, so myself and my agent at the time, we agreed all the figures, we agreed every bit of, last bit of money, spoke to Keith Haslam on the phone, spoke to Peter, Shir Peter Shirtliff on the phone, everything was sorted. So came up from Manchester the next day to sign the deal, everything was completely different to what we agreed just about to sign it and my, my agent actually spotted the, the errors and put it to Keith Haslam and he, he pretended he made a genuine mistake but I'd sort of been pre-warned that he might try that trick. Um, but once he did amend the contract to what we agreed, ever since then, my time with Keith Has Haslam, I don't really have anything bad to say. I know that he might not have ran the club as, as the fans might have liked but from a, as a player to a sort of boss, as a chairman, wages were paid on time for me um, he, he took an interest in what you were doing not just your football outside of outside of football so he actually was a good chairman for me but at the same time I can understand why not everybody has that sort of good perception of him. I really. find it quite interesting that you said Simon Brown warned you which leads me to ask did Simon Brown get stung by Haslam? Well I wonder if Simon Brown didn't spot the spot the little trick and he ended up signing the wrong deal um, but, but yeah, maybe he did get stung, but Brownie was, he was another one of the young players at the time who, who I, I thought we could actually go 
places and it's just a shame that it didn't turn out how we all would have hoped. People went the separate ways and, and eventually with that core of players we did end up getting relegated. So. Yeah, it could it's have gone shame. one or two, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it could have. I mean, could boys listening to that, obviously, Simon Brown, I think we all knew at the time he was a decent player with good prospects, but he, he was hampered, wasn't he, by quite a few injury problems which sort of held him back a little bit. Did you ever sort of look back and, and think, maybe if he didn't have any injuries, we could have been a little bit higher than what we were? I mean, when, when he when he played, and he played well, you know, we were, you know, we were quality. It was exciting, wasn't it? I yeah. think the that did get excited. I, I think did he did he end up with like the title super sub because yeah. he, he come on and every time he come on he seemed to score. Yeah. So he ended up like getting that sort of title. But then when when like he started like the next game, he couldn't seem to produce the same sort of performance as what he did as coming off the bench sort of thing. Yeah. It was his injuries really. Um that season, his sort of super sub season, he had bad hernias, both his hernias, and we couldn't really afford to send him for his hernia rock because we needed him, even if it was just for the last 20 minutes of mm -hmm. games. And like you were saying, it was such a boost. Like the lads would like graft for 70 minutes, then we'd see Brownie come on and it'd just lift you. You just think, right, we can push forward, put it in over the top or down the side, and Brownie will get a chance and he'll, he'll put one away for, for us. And, mm -hmm. and he did, he did do that. And, I ended up playing with Brownie later on in his career at Eastwood and he still he still had the ability then. Like he, he was a good lad, Brownie, and he did work really hard and he's a, another player who did love his time at Mansfield Town. And I think you look at the other players we had in there as well, obviously the young youthfulness of Simon Brown but also matched up by the experience of Richie Barker as well. Yeah, Richie Barker. And I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying this. Technically, he wasn't very good at all. Right for for a striker, he could. Don't get me wrong. He could hold it up and he could sort of bring people into play. But could he beat a man? No. Um, was he particularly skillful? No. But he put the ball in the box and he'll get there. Or just give him a, a chance at goal and he'd stick it away. Um, and as a captain, I don't think I've played under many better captains. Like he would tell you if you did something wrong and. And he'd really encourage you and praise you if you did something right. And and that really was helpful to the young lads. Um, not everybody saw eye to eye with him at the time when he was telling you off. But then the next day, they'd think about him and, and say, you know what, maybe he was right. Uh, Giles Coke, who I played centre midfield with and actually lived with for a while, him and Richie used to have some good arguments. But all the time, Coke would say, yeah, he was probably right. But Coke was... He was arrogant in a good way, he believed in his ability and I think that's why he actually ended up playing as high as he did because he, he, he wouldn't take anyone saying you're not good enough to play at that level and I think sometimes you do need that little bit of arrogance um, as long as it's sort of controlled and that, that will, will see you go places. It's just a shame you ruined it in the end by signing for Chesterfield, isn't it? I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> How could he? I, 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 I thought it was a strange move because I don't know if, if he actually ended up playing many games. He played, I reckon he played. I think he played a total of six, and uh, a lot of those were up from the bench, and then he got injured again. Yeah, so. he, he's another one who his career, although he has done well, is was hampered by injuries. He's only the same age as myself, and I don't think he's done a full season like uninterrupted in in a long, a long, long time. So, but he was. I really enjoyed playing with him because we had a good good balance. I would sort of do the holding and he would bomb on and go forward and um, we just had a really good understanding off the pitch as well. Like I said, I, I lived with him for two years um, so we had a really, really good partnership and friendship really in football. Fantastic. I'm just thinking back to the, the time you were there because you were there for a long period yeah. of time. Just, I think probably, it's fair to say, probably only a couple of years short of actually reaching testimonial mm -hmm. stage really. The centre midfield players that you would have played with, there was some absolute class in there. Stevie Dawson, to name yeah. but one, he's gone on to a, a great well, level as well. It's strange because when when Daw when I first signed saw it, Dawson could not get a, he couldn't get a game. In the end, he ended up being shifted to right midfield, and I think that was just because myself and, and Giles Coke had such a good understanding. Um, but obviously. I had my injury, Koki had his injury, gave Darcy his chance and he, t he took it. He was a tenacious player, Darcy, he worked so hard. Um, he could get forward but he could come back as well so he was sort of an all-rounder. Um, and yeah, Darcy was another one who, who I really did, really did enjoy, enjoy playing with. Um, 
Well, yeah, there's been a few. There's been quite a few who've, who've like even filled in there. I remember once playing a game centre mid with with Alex uh, Baptiste. Um, and he would play anywhere. I think if you told him to play up front, he'd play it. He'd, he'd, he'd give it his best. Um, but yeah, I, I, over my time, I, I've played with some really good players at Stags um, and like developed good friendships. And there's the, many of those players who I've mentioned I still speak to and um, would still like socialise with if I saw them. Um, so yeah, it was really, really good time. You strike me as the sort of person in the dressing room who everyone would talk to and everyone would get along with. Was that the case, or was there a few characters in there that you might have avoided and perhaps didn't see eye to eye with? No, do you know what? I think you're right the first time. Um, there's not. There's not. Oh, I'm trying to think. Well, yeah, there's a couple at my time at Man City who I probably wouldn't speak to again in football. But at, at Stags, um, I, like you said, I got on with everyone. I'm quite sort of level headed, so even if I disagreed with you with something, I would still, I would still talk to you about it. And that, I suppose, I've used that experience. I, at different clubs I've been captains and my sort of my captaincy style isn't get in your face and shout at someone I'll talk to someone and say look at like you need to do this or you need to do that and I think it different managers want different things um, I know when I was captain at Stags I know David Holzer wanted me, want me to grip people by the throat and things and if he knew anything about me he'd know that He's picked the wrong captain here because I'm not going to do that. No matter, no matter how much you ask me to do it, it's not my style. I can't, I can't change who I am. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I've used my experience over over the years, and it has just made me level-headed. And and I am quite calm. Some people tell me I'm too calm, but but that's just the way I am, really. <laughs> Is that a big reason why you sort of wanted to go into education over? coaching or management then? Yeah, and I think for me, I, I've, always, I've said to my girlfriend, I want to be a football fan. Like, I know, I know you guys like, are working sort of in the football industry. I, when I finish football, I just want to turn the TV on, sorry, <coughs> turn the TV on and just watch a game or go and watch a match. I don't really want the sort of added added thing of actually coaching someone or working with someone. I just literally want to sit back, enjoy and think, I've done this myself like for a long time. Now it's my time to just get s something back from it just by watching it. And yeah, education. Um, I, I was, I did, well, I did well at school. My dad always said, you're not playing football unless you do well in your GCSE. So I always had that sort of drive to, to do well academically. Um, and I sort of followed my brother's footsteps. He played football and when his career ended, he got into teaching. And it just seemed sort of a natural progression for me. Sorry. <coughs> a bit of a tickly throat, but um, yeah. Education definitely suits me, definitely suits me because I don't, it's very rare that I shout at the kids to just stay level-headed just like I am in football. I really here. can't see you as, I mean, the, when you came in and you told us before that you're a maths teacher, I was a bit like, great. Because I, I really respect you. Know, I quite enjoy watching you play. Like me and maths teachers <laughs> didn't get on. Didn't get on. I'm absolutely rubbish at maths. Cam, producer Cam, for those who can't see, is nodding away in the corner because he knows how long it took me to pass a maths exam. Yes, three attempts it, it took me. Yeah. Which is two plus one and four minus one. Well, yeah, well. correct. Well, I think my actual students. I think they like the fact that I'm not your sort of conventional maths teacher without sort of a sort of sporty side. If you go through the maths teachers at my school, yeah, there's, we've got one who's, um, she's played hockey at quite a good standard, but the rest, if you mention sport to them, they'll run a mile. Like, that's the only running they'll ever do. So <laughs> it's, um, it's, the kids sort of respect it, especially the ones that are Mansfield Town fans. They, they, they will do whatever I tell them to do. And I think it's mainly their parents, because they might have, been, might have been a bit too young to remember me playing there myself, but, but the parents will say, yeah, listen, make sure you listen to JD, don't give him any back chat, and um, so that sort of works in my favour as well. Yeah, I mean, you have been quite proactive on social media, sharing that you're going to come on here tonight, yeah. which means the kids who are Mansfield fans and who, who've got parents who are Mansfield fans, yeah. they will have seen that as well. So have you had sort of any 
any of the kids coming up? Yeah, to there's. I'm, I'm, I need to mention um, one of my students, Robin Homer. Um, her and her family, they're big Stag season ticket holders. Um, and she said to me, if I mention her name, her dad will donate ten pound um, to the cause. <laughs> so I'm going to mention her name. What's her and name again? She's Robin. Robin Homer. It's Robin Homer. Robin, Robin Homer. Homer name? Yeah, Robin Homer. Yeah. yeah. So, so many times you say Homer. it. Yeah. Every is it ten pound for each time you say the name? Ten pound for each time, <laughs> but I think it also extends to people in a family. So maybe a dad, a dad yeah. Yeah, could get involved. I know she's Mr. definitely Hayes. got a younger sister, <laughs> so a younger Mr. sister. So that's that's at least thirty pound, and yeah. I don't know how many times we've said her name as well. And in fact, I'll chuck in uh, my girlfriend Kelly and little lad Charlie. They can chuck in a tenner as well. <laughs> so um, all for a good cause. Fantastic! Mm. And if you want to find out more details about the uh, Alzheimer's Society, we're donating and uh, raising money for all the links that you need are in the description. Make sure you click on that donate button because if you don't and you go to Jenny's school, <laughs> somebody's getting an after school detention. Yes, yeah, so I will. If she pays it me in cash, I will donate it myself out of my own bank. Job done, so. job done. Excellent, as always. We, we were talking a little bit before about managers. We'll address Mr Holdsworth later on. Okay, yeah. Um, because I get quite riled up when I talk about him, so it's probably best to do that I don't again. Know, I don't know why. I couldn't think why at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. um, um, but let's go back to the start, obviously. Peter Shirtliff was the yeah. manager when uh, you were signed. Tell us a little bit more about him, then, and sort of your relationship I, with him. Yeah, I really liked him as a person. Um, I think it was a bit like myself in terms of his mannerisms he was he was quite reserved and calm he could shout at us if we needed to but he'd always see the positive side of things and I actually was gutted when he um, when he lost his job I understand why he did but I think I actually think we would have been able to stay up had he actually stayed so he he um, came to watch me play for City with Man City reserves quite a few times uh, himself, like he didn't get his assistant or anyone to. He actually came to watch the games, and he um, after I spoke to Stuart Pearce at Man City, I got a phone call from him, and he said he really likes me, really wants me to come. Um, I always had a really good relationship with him, um, and he he believed in me as a player, and and he took that interest in my personal life, which does make a difference for a footballer. Like if a manager shows that they care not just about how you are as a player, then it does, it makes you want to try even harder for them. Um, he obviously picked me every single game that I was available uh, under Peter Shirtliff, I started. Um, again, I had a good rapport with all the players at the time, and, and I think we went, we went, his first season, well, first season when I was with him, we did quite well, I, can't, I think we finished, I can't remember where we finished, but, um, I think then, it was it was mid it was a good mid table. Yeah, it was the same year because he took over from Carlton Palmer. Carlton Palmer, Palmer yeah. Who, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah. I think was it that, was that the same year what we got to the uh, FA Cup? It was. It would have been the you FA Cup. Yeah. So no. looking back through the reports. Yeah, and no, I was gutted about that of the FA Cup scenario again. That was it was a bizarre one as well because in one hand the fact that Man City wouldn't let me play in the FA Cup genuinely made me think <laughs> I might get to play in the final here at Wembley if City get there um, but then but then for them when I went back to City to say oh actually you can sign for Stags we've accepted the bid it just made me think why didn't you let me play in the cup um, I've never never got the opportunity to play at St James's Park it's one of the one of the grounds that um, I've never actually got to set, um, set foot on I was on the bench um, under Kevin Keegan when we played Newcastle away but I never came on so I never actually played on on that pitch so it was just a strange one for me um, was you at the, did you go to the game? I was at the game yeah I travelled with the squad stayed in the hotel which was nice because I did feel a part of it um, and obviously we'd we did well, we did really well. There was no shame in losing to was it Alan Shearer's yeah. it was a record equal it was, goal. Yeah, goal. It was a landmark goal and all the lads did brilliant and at the time I, I was really good friends with Nathan Arnold and I was really happy he got his opportunity to um to play to play on the pitch. I think he ended up coming on because I know he was, he likes sort of supports Newcastle as well, so it was a good good day for him. But it was just really strange, really strange that I didn't get the opportunity to play. Um, I remember that game. It's funny because um, obviously we obviously we wanted Mansfield to win, but you know when Shearer did equal that goal, it was the only time when I think we've ever wanted Shearer just to get another goal because obviously that was like going to go down in, in history you know, yeah, against us. So it's yeah. funny that we weren't the opposition to actually score, and if they did, it was good. It had to be Shearer. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a funny, it was a, a brilliant day. Out that was. Wasn't it? It, it was fantastic, and um, again, Peter Shirtliff was a the manager then, and I know he he rang up Stuart Pearce several times saying, "Please, just just let let him play in the game," which in a way would have been bad for Stephen Dawson because he he played in all the rounds previously, 
And if I was to then play and then start and take his place, it would have been bad for him. But um, I'm happy uh, Doris got to play there in the end. Not many footballers would say that. No. no. Not, like other footballers would genuinely sit there and say, I tried to injure him in training, <laughs> tried to poison him in the hotel. No, it's just, it's just not my nature. Yeah. Yeah. I know it, it does sound a cliche, but I am a big believer in the sort of team game aspect. Don't get me wrong, I want to play, but if I'm not playing and you're in my position, I want you to do well. I want you to do well for the team. If that means I've got to sit on the bench for a few weeks, then I've got to sit on the bench for a few weeks. Um, so yeah, I know that's that's not everybody's mentality in football, but it it, def <coughs> sorry, it definitely is mine. And there should mm. be a lot, a lot more of that. I think <laughs> that is why this man in that chair is so well respected and held in high regard by Mansfield fans, isn't it? Definitely. Most definitely. And, and players as well, you know, yeah. the world spoke very high. Yeah, well, yeah well, we so. always try and dish, we always try and get dirt on a player before oh, you get nothing on, on me. We've got yeah. absolutely nothing, we've genuinely got nothing. No, you won't get anything, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> try and stay clean. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's great to hear. Now, obviously that Newcastle game was probably, that. I imagine it was, was a, Almost a low point for you because you weren't, weren't yeah. playing and the frustration surrounding yeah. that. But what was the, the real low point? Was it, is, is it the injury? The low point was my injury because uh, up until that, that, um, that game, it was Notts County away. I might have picked up the odd calf injury that would kept me out for two or three days, but I was never injured. I just never got an injury. And I remember um, at the time, like I said, it was uh, Notts County away. And I think it was, well, it was Mike Edwards for Notts County who was playing centre mid. And um, I sort of landed funny on my ankle, but it, it wasn't anything too bad. But then he then landed on top of my ankle and I just did something crack. Ooh. And I still thought, do you know what? I reckon I'll be able to get up here and, and shake it off. And I got up and I just fell straight back down. And I thought, oh, this, this isn't going to be a one or two day injury. Um, this is going to be going to be a big one. So for me, that was that was definitely the low point because the sort of aftermath of that injury, um, the operations I had and the time it was taking me to recover, it, it did make me think, this might be it. I might not actually be able to play football to the best of my ability again. And I genuinely feel that it took me 18 months since um, making my comeback. It was still 18 months after that that I got fully fit. And by that time, I'd let, I'd, well, I think I'd just left Stags. So I actually only returned to complete full fitness when I'd left, which was really frustrating because I wake up in the morning after like, after training the day before and my ankle was, it was killing me. It was like crippling pain. And, but like by midday, it had sort of eased off. Um, but yeah, that was probably one of the few low, low points, that and the relegation um, at Mansfield Town. But yeah, that injury really took it out of me. It, the only thing it did do is it prepared me for something that happened later when I did the exact same thing to my other ankle. Um, I thought there will be a light at the end of the tunnel, I will carry on playing football and I had the same operation on my left ankle as I'd had on my right ankle and I managed to get back quicker and I don't know how much of that was just my sort of mi mindset of just believing that it it will work, it will heal. Because um, at times at Stags, I was at, after that injury, I was thinking this is never ever going to be right again. What but, helped you through that situation, through oh, the low point? Do you know what? Um, it was genuinely the support of the players, um, and also it was me wanting to get back on the pitch. It was the season we got relegated, and I've watched many games when we got battered. And I'm not saying I would have made the difference, but I was thinking. I, sat in the stand here, I'm not helping anyone. Um, I, I did bits of work on the radio actually whilst I was injured and I really enjoyed it, but deep down I was thinking, I need to get back on that pitch. So it was just that determination to help the club. Um, and I did make my comeback that season we went down. And whether I should have or not is like a, a difficult thing because I wasn't the same player when I came back because I was still struggling with the injuries, but. I declared myself fit for selection and then it was just up to up to the manager at the time um, if he'd pick me or not and maybe I wasn't completely right but I still wanted to just give give all that I could at the time. 
I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about the relegation in depth yeah. later on, but um, just talking about them, you mentioned managers again yeah. there and, and how they reacted with you. You had a good relationship with yeah. Peter Shirtlift. Then I think w- I was going to ask, and then we went off on a tangent, as we always do on the show. That's, <laughs> that's the nature of the show, so it's, it's fine. Um, I was going to uh, put it to you two, because I think of all the managers that you look back over the history of our managers, of all the managers that I personally was disappointed to see go when he did was Peter Shirtlift, because he seemed to have assembled a decent enough squad with a little bit more investment mm. and a bit more of an experienced coaching team behind him. I always felt that we were on the cusp of something with him. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? Because you look at that time, I mean, I, without looking, I don't know exactly what, what players he brought in. Well, we know two. Did, uh, did, did you bring Bolden in as well? I can't remember now. Yeah. 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 Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Mullins. Yeah. Johnny, Johnny Mullins yeah. ended up coming so in. You look at the players that he actually managed to bring in, um, and you look at that, you know, they've all gone on to have, you know, really good careers and they're all, you look at the, it's like the relegation, you look at the team, you know, the names on the team sheet and you, think you just sometimes can't understand how we actually end up going, end up going down, but, you know, he, he did bring in some quality players and uh, it wasn't just quality players, I think it was players who were the right sort of people to be, who I think, to play for Mansfield Town. You know, we look at what we've had this season, you sometimes question what they're here for, if they're here for money or, or whatever, but... Um, you know those players back then they were players that were playing for the shirt and I think it's something that you miss a bit now in, in football but you know whatever Peter Shirtliff was doing he was doing it right he was get, getting the right people in and getting them to play the right way really and then Billy did and followed Peter Shirtliff yeah. what was your relationship like with Billy because we've got we've had contrasting oh, reports yeah. on the deal and situation yeah. you know what yeah. I, I know it sounds a bit repetitive it's, it's not the case with every manager at Stags but no, we'll I, get to that I, <laughs> we will get to that I really liked Billy Dearden and he sort of was like a granddad figure for everyone like we saw this <laughs> <laughs> we saw this, <laughs> we saw this <laughs> I mean, he used to fall over when he used to cross the ball uh, yeah but he was <laughs> so he was so funny I remember it because obviously I wasn't he was manager at Stags previously before he yes. came back wasn't he mm. and I wasn't there for that um, that time and I remember seeing this old man walk in and say I'm your new manager and I was thinking he, he can't manage our football club but <laughs> someone just let him out take care of him around but, yeah but um, I really liked him he didn't do much of the coaching he left that to Dutch and, and whoever else was there but he picked the team he was really good sort of motivator he, he reminded me of Kevin Keegan in, in a way because Kevin Keegan as a coach was pretty useless but as a motivator to get you up for games, like you would, you would die for him. Like you would literally do everything you could, like for the cause. Um, and Billy did, and when he took over that time, he definitely had the sort of new manager effects because I remember he, I think he ended up signing Barry Conlon. Yeah, we lost Barker to Hartlepool. Yeah, and then and then he signed I think Conlon and Grits. And Grits, yeah. yeah. And we had five or six games where those two were unplayable. Like, neither of them had much pace, but they were big target men. We could bang the ball up to them. Um, and, yeah, Billy did and definitely sort of got the good vibe back, uh, which we needed. Um, and Conlon and, and Grits, they did really well for us. They, they both scored both scored a lot of goals. Conlon was useless at training, but, but <laughs> he, scored, um, he scored some goals for us. But Billy did, and he was a really, really nice guy. And he was another one who... When he lost his job, like I, just, I felt like I was losing a family member in a way, because mm-hmm. um, he he believed in me, he believed in in uh, what we were trying to do um, at the time. He wanted us to play nice football, but he also understood that it's not always possible, especially when we've got Grits and Barry Conlon up front, two big big men. At times, we'd have to go along to them, get them to win the headers, and and so on. So he he was a good. He was a good football man, he understood football, he wasn't just, uh, although he was old for manager, he wasn't set in his ways, he, he, could, he could adapt, um, and I think Dutch, Paul Holland really helped him out at the time, sort of with the coaching side, coaching side of things, so I did really get on with him, like I was, I was disappointed because um, he obviously lost his job just before, just before we got relegated and, and I, I suffered my injury like when he was, when he was a gaffer. And Is it true that he drove you up to the northeast somewhere to have a scan or something or yeah yeah he did he did yeah yeah I forgot Billy did in this is, yeah, yeah Billy did and um because I had what happened with my injury um I I had a scan initially in Sheffield and the club sent me to a surgeon that they'd used a lot and the players nicknamed him the butcher because all he wanted to do was just cut you up like whether you had anything <laughs> wrong or not he just wanted to cut you so he did that with me I had my first operation in Chef, he 
cut my ankle open. Uh, Sheffield, not a chef's Sorry. kitchen, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just just got on the butcher thing and trying <laughs> to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it? And then he come out with, with a plate of steaks. <laughs> yeah, he's all right. He took me to Sheffield and he opened up my ankle and he assessed the damage and he just did nothing. He literally left it and said, put it in a boot for three months, then start doing rehab and it should be healed. So we did that. Three months went by, did my rehab, and then the pre-season, the following pre-season, I tried to do training, and I literally couldn't run. I said, this ankle feels no better than when I did the injury. Um, so the physio we had at the time, he, um, he said, I know someone. Can you remember who the physio yeah, was? Yeah, it was Barry Stephen. Because um, he, he was, I think he was, he, only, he was only the physio for two or three weeks or months, because... He'd been Paul, there a long, time. Yeah, long, he'd been there time, a while, yeah. but the physio we had, Paul Maiden, I think he was on holiday or something, um, and Barry was like, listen, I know someone up in North Allerton, which was miles away, um, who can give you a second opinion. And Billy Deirdre insisted himself on driving me there, taking me for the scan, um, and the surgeon there, he said he cannot believe that the surgeon in Sheffield didn't actually repair the damage, because the ligament was the ligaments were damaged beyond repair, like they wouldn't just heal themselves. So um, he said, what I need, it's like a, quite a pioneering thing at the time. They put two screws either side of your ankle and a, a metal wire goes through your ankle, through the bone, and it, it acts as an artificial ligament. Um, and he said it needs repairing. Like, I can tell you now, that will not heal itself. There's so no So when way you go to an it. airport, do you beep when you well, go I through the Well, I don't, because mm. apparently the, the density or something of the metal isn't enough to set off the, set off the things. <laughs> uh, but if they, they do tell you, if it does happen, you just need to tell them what procedure you had. Um, so yeah, Billy Damon took me for the scan. He took me for the operation. And like I said, that meant so much to me. Mm. That did mean so much to me because he he was like he went above and beyond. He went above and beyond um, what he actually needed to do as a manager. So that was brilliant. That was brilliant. It's great to hear, isn't it? That he's doing that. But just I've got this picture in my mind now. Yeah. Every, right, <laughs> you know where it's probably know where it's going. Everyone that's talked about Billy Dean has described him as a granddad figure. Yeah. Please tell me he has some sort of granddad type tapes in his car and a packet <laughs> of Werther's originals. So that's going to ruin the illusion. Do you know not. what? The whole time I was in the car, he was on the phone to his wife. Like, and I think it was a two hour journey. They were just talking like through the day. Oh, he was just bless. talking about the scenery. So it was you nice. Fall asleep, well, no, I didn't. I didn't fall asleep. But um, and I think on the way back, he just put on a, a, a well. I say. Did he wear his flat cap? Yeah, he, he, the flat cap was on. Flat cap was on. Um, but yeah, he was such a nice guy, and he was a, a granddad figure. And I think when he did when he did tell us all that they've they've sacked him, he was genuinely upset. Like he he wanted to keep us up. His his mission that season was to keep us in the division. Um, and yeah, the damage was already done, but he didn't he didn't really get the chance to to see that through. Um, so yeah, he he was another another really nice manager for me. I I'm interested to know what what negative things people have got to say about him. I, I think I, I think the Very only well, negative we've had, to be fair, is is so far anyway. Yeah. is from the Ian Bowling episode because when a manager gets rid of you, you're bound to. Oh, of course, yeah. And it, the fact I think at that time he brought two or three extra keepers in, and he'd yeah. been there for five mm. yeah. five years. He'd been captain of the club. Yeah. I think you can probably see. Oh yeah, you can that's understand the way that. it was handled. Yeah. I think. yeah, yeah. If you if you've been let go by a manager and you still think you can do the business, yeah, there is. Yeah, I can understand that completely. I can and we're going to talk that about that and how that happened for yeah. you at Mansfield yeah. in the uh, second half of the program. It's been very very insightful uh, so far. Lots to come here on the show, including. A trip down memory lane. It's all about you, the okay. quiz. <laughs> uh, last week, Mickey Bolding absolutely smashed it <laughs> out of the park with, what was it, eight correct in one minute yeah, 38? But you say absolutely smashed it, it was by one second in the end. So well, it's yeah, not, but. Not absolutely smashed it, to be honest. He got off to an absolute flyer. It took him to a qu uh, question six to, uh, to get one wrong, and that's only because. We asked him how many managers at the club he played under, and he played under Billy Dearden twice, so he ah, said four, okay. and it was actually three, and oh, I was right. being pedantic and one not four. So. No, no, yeah, you're yeah. right. I'm, so. I'm going to aim to beat him, but yeah, fingers but. crossed. I mean, uh, obviously, whilst we're on the subject, you would have played 
with Mickey in yeah. his second spell uh, yeah. at the club when he was banging all the goals in. Yeah. What was he uh, like as a character? Because we were trying to get some uh, dirt from Bobby Hassel on him when, when Bobby was here a couple of weeks ago and he was saying the only thing he did after training was eat, uh, was it double chocolate, 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 chocolate muffin? muffin. Yeah. Oh, did he? Yeah. Well, I think when the second time he was at Stags, because he was a bit older, he's probably looking after his body a bit more. Like he was, now he was a, he was a machine, fitness machine. He's the fastest, he was the fastest old player that I've <laughs> ever played with. I couldn't believe like I couldn't believe it how quick he was. I think he must have been he must have been in his thirties maybe, low thirties when when I was with him at Stags and he was rapid. He was he was one of our quicker players. Um again really nice guy, really level headed, um and just someone who was a pleasure like to, to know as well as as well as to play with and that season he was absolute goal machine. He was scoring goals from all angles like and and again, for his age, someone someone of that age banging them in like that, especially when um, when Richie Barker had gone, like we needed we needed those goals definitely. You know, he always said to us that uh, every manager ever played under tried to stick him out on the left wing, and he begged yeah. and begged and begged <laughs> to play up front. Well, my the first game that I remember him playing, uh, we were away, I think. But well, when I, when I uh, signed again, at, uh, when he signed again, sorry, I think we were away at. It was, it was the first game of the season, I can't remember who it was. But he played out wide on the left wing. We had Matt Hampshire on the right and Mickey on the left. And he scored, he scored from left wing. Um, and I think he, th- I, I thought, yeah, this is our left winger, but he could tell. Is it true? I've just remembered this. Yeah. It was Peter Shirtliff, the manager. Yeah. He was playing on the left, as you say, he scored, and mm. he, he ended up staying on the left. Shrewsbury. Is it true? That he once went to Peter Shirtliff with a DVD of him playing up front, and <laughs> Shirtliff pulled him up about it in training when he was taking a corner. Can you remember that? I it, can't it, remember it. I can't remember it. But apparently, it, the instant goes. The story goes. He was you were doing corner draw, set yeah. piece draws, doing corner. He went over to take a corner, yeah. and Shirtliff came down and he said, "Mick, I've watched your DVD. <laughs> You're still not playing up front." And well, everyone were looking at him and say. DVD, what DVD? I think, yeah, I think it's like that way. Yeah. But it's do like, you know what? If that came from Mickey Bolding, I 100% believe it's true. Like, he <laughs> I can't see, I can't see him lying or exaggerating. He's quite embarrassed about it. To be honest, yeah, I can't see him exaggerating the truth. But as a, he was right. As a striker, he was clinical. Maybe we should have put him up front um, earlier, earlier in the season because, like, we definitely needed someone else to chip in with the goals. So Mickey. Mickey definitely is a good lad and he, he, he has got the attributes to be a good striker so yeah we should have listened to him and stuck him up there from the start. Mm. Mm. Certainly well we'll mm. talk about your goal contributions. Prolific. How many was it? I think it was two. <laughs> well it was it was one in the football league and then oh no 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 then I got two in hmm, I hope that's not one of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many of them were meant though? <laughs> how many were meant? Um, yeah, I know uh, Cam I mean, actually, before we say it again, uh, there's one goal against Weymouth. Uh, well, talk us through it, and was it was it deliberate? That, that was the best goal I've ever. Well, <laughs> one of the best goals I've ever scored. I remember we had a long throw in, um, and we had big Jason Lee up front, and he's flicked it on. But instead of flicking it into the box, he sort of flicked it to the edge of the box. And I was I remember racing against uh, one of my friends for who played for Weymouth at the time, and we were just competing to get to the ball, managed to get there and, and I volleyed it in the corner, I don't understand where you're getting this, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, did, managed... you, did you notice when the teacher's flick <laughs> yeah, came out, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it was completely intentional, um, but yeah, I, I really I really did enjoy that goal because it was it was the winner. I think most of my, most of my goals at Stags, oh yeah, there are three that I can think of. Um, it is three, w- don't worry, were, that's not a question. <laughs> were, um, were important, whether match winning or got us a draw or, or something. Um, so yeah, yeah. I've, although I've never ever been a prolific goal scorer, um, I, I do enjoy scoring scoring the actual goals. Well, we'll uh, find out a little bit more about what you remember in the uh, second <laughs> half of the show as we play the It's All About You quiz. So far, it's been a very insightful interview with uh, with with JD. It's there's certainly a few things uh, which have opened my eyes, and there's plenty more to delve into as well, isn't there? Yeah, a little bit different from Mickey. <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> yeah, we'll tell you the story about the Chris packet in the break. Oh, okay, as well, and, I'm looking forward to that and, one. Uh, anyone else that uh, yeah. is referring to it? Watch last week's episode yeah. back. It's a fantastic and hilarious story. And if you're eating a packet of crisps right now, well, unlucky. It had, might uh, put you yeah, off it, might, it might put you off. <laughs> uh, as always, though, this is the A Trip Down Memory Lane podcast for Mansfield Matters. It's all raising money for the Alzheimer's Society, a fantastic charity who support people 
who uh, sadly lived their lives struggling with dementia. One such person being Stag's legend Kevin Bird. As always, it's time to take a break and take a little look about what your donation donations can do to help the fantastic charity. Where did you see me in five years' time, Doctor? And he said, well, you won't be alive in five years' time. I was scared, confused. I got very depressed, and that's not me. It's not my personality. So I decided, and I'm so ashamed now, that I can end it all. This happens to so many people. It's not just my nan, it's not just my family. Uh, the hardest part, it was probably when I went to visit her a couple of weeks ago. And, sorry. She didn't, didn't know who I was. That was, that was pretty hard. The only way we're gonna find a cure is through research. The more money that can be spent on research, even better. It's a devastating thing. Both my parents uh, have dementia. My father, Frederick Ramsdale, is being stuck in hospital now for his 10th week. We've been told that Dad is ready to be discharged. In fact, he was medically fit to be discharged five weeks ago. The government just aren't putting enough money into social care. People with dementia are being let down. There are literally hundreds and thousands of families and individuals going through exactly what we are and actually if we all group together we can really really make a difference and start to see some change. I spent two to three hours with Peter talking to him. He really felt like he didn't know where his life was going. And it was like someone turned the light switch on. That lady saved my life. She really saved my life. Sorry, because she made me realise that there was there is life. You know when you get your sorry, you know when you get your um, you get that diagnosis. And I thought everything was over. I can never ever thank her enough for what she did. And then I started going to the dementia camp, the Alzheimer's Society. Fantastic. And if you want to donate to our cause, the Alzheimer's Society, all the links that you need are in the description for that. You can donate direct to the Alzheimer's Society or you can donate to Mansfield Matters. 80% of all donations received go to the charity, 20% back into the running costs for this project. So it's been a fantastic summer so far. It's been a great first half with our guest, Jonathan Delaye as well, who's been in here talking to us, revealing stories and things like that. But let's just talk seriously uh, for a moment. Obviously, we thank you very much for your time for coming down here uh, tonight no doubt avoided some marking some maths marking tonight. yeah there's always marking to do and it's actually a really important day tomorrow because it's the first GCSE maths exam uh, for the year 11 so oh. they've got their first exam tomorrow so I'm sure they'll be doing a lot of nervous revision um, I'm actually getting into school early tomorrow morning just to do a last minute revision session with them so it is quite a big day for them but I feel quite bad now because we've kept no, that late no, now you're up again early I've got I've got nothing, nothing to do, nothing to do tonight really, I'm just planning, uh, everything's all planned, ready to go tomorrow. Oh fantastic, well uh, obviously you know, we thank you for, for coming down as we say, obviously it's for uh, a really great course, I think yeah. it's fair to say that everybody has been affected by, or knows somebody that's been affected by dementia in some way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunately it's such a common, common illness and, and it's one that, like thanks to your work and other people, it, people are becoming more aware of it. And, and more needs to be done in terms of research, in terms of care, because as you said, I can't really think of anybody who in some way uh, doesn't know somebody that's been, been affected by, by the illness, and, and like I said, the more high profile we can make it, hopefully uh, the more that can be done to help people. And one of the biggest things as well when it comes to sport is there was the link between heading the old style exactly. footballs, and then there was the discussion about whether kids should be heading footballs in PE lessons and things like that. Is that something which crossed your mind from a teaching perspective when you were obviously down the PE yeah, route? Yeah, do you know, I had 
think when I was teaching PE, it was more the rugby and sort of contact with your head in rugby that could cause a problem. But now they have they have started to investigate whether we should be um, encouraging students to head the ball. Currently, there's no, well, at, at my school anyway, there's no sort of restriction on heading. So I do know the PE teachers will allow uh, students to head the ball. But again, with more money, we can get more investigation into it and, and see if there genuinely is a link. I, if I'm honest, I do think there must be. There, there must be some some link. You can't have, it's like a boxer getting continuous blows on the head, maybe not to the same extent, but any any sort of damage to your head will, will affect sort of the capability of your brain. So there must be a link there. And more, more work is needed, whether the balls need to change or something like that, because if we're realistic, I don't think we'll ever stop heading in football. Um, the game would be a different game. It completely anyway. changed the game. Yeah. It had completely changed the game. But even if there's just little steps that we can do to sort of help things, and that that would be good. And obviously, I mean, as yourself, sorry, let's go on. You I say, to be honest, I think English players should learn to probably play on the floor a bit yeah. more anyway now. Yeah. So you look at Spain and stuff, so it probably benefit us in that way, but... Yeah. Who knows? I was just going to say, obviously, for yourself, you'd yeah. sort of like to break up play quite yeah. a lot. You weren't afraid to get stuck into a challenge. Yeah. You know, you were quite lucky in some respects, other than the, the ankle injury, which yeah. just, that you weren't a massive one who, who always picked up niggles. But did you ever, do you ever look back and, and think some of some of the challenges you might have gone into aerially or whatever, whether it was physical contact, that that might sort of affect you in later life? Or I didn't know. Um, but what I do remember is the only time I've ever been like knocked unconscious. Um, when I was coming back from my injury, one of my first games back, we played Darlington away, uh, and it was a time when we were scrapping for a point, and we managed to get a good one-one draw. I remember coming on at half time, and I um, I literally lasted ten minutes because I remember going up to head a ball. The next thing I know, I was in the changing room getting stitches on the back of my head. Um, so obviously I. would I'd taken some blow to my head, and I, I to this day I can I can feel it. There's only a small lump there now, but I can feel exactly exactly where it happened. Um, but no, I think when you're playing, you're so engrossed in the game and things that you don't really think, "Wow, this could impact my my uh, life in the future." I, like you said, I would get stuck in. I would say one of my weak points was my heading. So. I would challenge, I'll challenge for any ball, but I often didn't make contact with it, but at least I challenged. Um, but there's some players who their main game is to head the ball. I can only think of people like Reader, who, who obviously was at Stags, I was with him at Eastwood Town. We would hit the ball to him and he would head everything. Um, and I, well, yeah, he's, like you said, I've, I've seen clips at Lincoln and, and for players like that, maybe it has reached the point where they're thinking, actually, is, is something down the line might might it affect me? I remember, I think I read something about Alan Shearer. Who, um, he expressed he did a documentary, yeah. didn't he, about heading in football and the yeah. documentary, and yeah. he got himself tested as well, didn't he? Exactly. So it is becoming more and more high profile, and it is obviously something. Um, that needs further looking into. Certainly is, and that's a, a big reason why we're doing this. Obviously, Mansfield Town legend Kevin Bird, a big, uh, you know, much loved character at the club. Sadly, living uh, with dementia. Me and Nathan have sort of seen, you know, firsthand the extent of his dementia as well. So, anyone who's watching this tonight, whether it's 50p, whether it's a pound, or whatever you want to give, every little donation that you give goes a very, very long way to help with things such as research and things like that. So, if you've enjoyed any of the series any of the funny stories, any of the interviews, please, please uh, do click on that donate button. And uh, if you go to JD's school and you don't, detention's on the way. Detention, yeah. Yes, detention's yeah, on, on the way. Uh, right, then, let's uh, turn it on his head and, and do the uh, feature which we're all been looking forward to. It's the one which causes the most controversy. Uh, it's the It's All About You quiz. Each former player will face ten questions all about them and their time at Mansfield Town FC. They'll go up against the clock, and the person with the most correct answers in the quickest time at the end of the series will be crowned the winner. Same pass will add plus ten seconds, whereas an incorrect answer will add just five. So if you don't know, you might as well just just have a go anyway. Yes, yeah. It's all about tactics in this game, and I think you, I think you're going to do very well with hope it. So, I hope High so. standards. <laughs> the current leaders so far: uh, Mickey Bolding, one minute thirty-eight seconds. Just behind him, just a second behind, uh, is Ian Bolding, one minute thirty-nine, and then in third place, uh, Bobby Hassel, one minute forty-nine. I'm going to ask you where you want to come, but you're a competitive person, so I know what the answer is going to be. I'm aiming for the top. Aiming for the top. I'll be disappointed if I don't. 
if I, no, I know Mick is intelligent, so if I don't get second, I'll be extremely disappointed, but I'm, I'm going for first. Fantastic. Your time will start after I've asked the first question. Okay. I say that more for Simon's benefit, because he's on the timing, so oh, yeah. yeah it, it's all good fun. Uh, there are 10 questions, and they're all about your career, as I say, and your time at Mansfield Town FC. So okay. let, let's take you on a trip down memory lane and see what you can get in the All It's All About You quiz. Simon, are you ready on the stopwatch? Let's do this. JD, are you ready? Yes, good to go. Okay, Nathan, if you want to help, you can in any way, but you're the, you, you're, you're the judge at the end. You're the, the, you're the judge, judge at the end. Okay, uh, you ready? Good to go. Okay, JD, you arrived initially on loan from Manchester City. Against who did you make your debut? Start the clock. Barnett. You made over 150 appearances, but only managed three goals. The first was an 87th minute winner against who? Wickham. You were part of club history as one of the starting 11 in the first game outside of the Football League. A 2 2 draw against who? Uh, uh, Kidderminster. You were called up for the England Seaside during the stag spell in the conference. Which of your teammates also got a call? Nathan Arnold. Which of your teammates from the 2005-2006 season also began their stag's career with a loan spell from Man City? We stay. Between yourself and your teammate and central midfield partner Stephen Dawson, who made more appearances for the Stags? Me. Under how many permanent managers did you serve at the club? Permanent managers. Four. After the departure of Billy McEwen, which of your two teammates took caretaker charge until the appointment of David Holdsworth? Amy Rose, yes, Mark Stallard. Star moment, star moment is an anagram of which fellow central midfielder, a teammate during the 09, 08, 09 season? Star moment. Um, uh, Matty Sumner. The Stags made one appearance in the now defunct Satanta Shield Trophy, losing on penalties to, Lord, to York City. You scored one of the two spot kicks. Who got the other? Gavin Horan. Stop the clock. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Oh, I've just had a little. that I'm not confident on at I, all. I've just had a little look at um, at your time on this. <laughs> okay. Oh, Nathan. Really Nathan. One, one. Nathan. How how did he do? I don't how know. do you think? There was a couple of questions which it took a long time to answer. Oh, kind of sorry, went, Come on, um, come on. Um, <laughs> I'm and I think there's. I know. Well, I know we've won wrong. Um, obviously, I'm not sure about the rest, so I don't know. It could be, I think it's going to be close again. Okay, which one? You said you desperately wanted to help him on one. Which was the one you wanted to help him on? If I, if I remember, I, I wasn't quite concentrating actually, but I think, did you say the first conference game? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is obviously absolute, so when you said Kevin. Absolute away. Um, oh, yeah. that, <laughs> oh dear. How do you think you did? I think I got seven. So you think you got seven? I think I got seven, yeah. Which one do you think you slipped I think on? the absolute one, the star moment one, I have no idea on that. And. I think the permanent the permanent manager one sort of threw me a bit because I can't remember I can't remember whether to count Dutch as a permanent manager or not because I can't remember if he was caretaker or if he was actually a permanent manager. Um, so there are the three that I was okay, least I'll, I'll put you out of your misery. Yeah. Ed Fleet, we can we, yeah, we know you got Ed wrong. Fleet, I remember that. Out of the two, which one would you be more pleased to get right between the anagram and the oh, managers? If the anagram's right, I'd be shocked. I'd be really shocked. You pulled that out of the bag. Is that? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, te te that. technically, I shouldn't accept your answer because you said Matty Sumner. Matthew Sumner. No, 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 it's not Matt Sumner. Yeah, Matt yeah, Sumner. So don't but but I'm that. not going to give you the answer. I'm going to give you the oh, point. thank you. Um, the other one, the permanent managers, Let's have a panel discussion. Would you accept Paul Holland as a permanent manager, Nathan? Yes or no? I can't remember, but oh, I don't know. I, I really don't. Yes, probably. Simon? No. Uh, Han? Not all. You can shout up. It'll pick you up. He's, yeah. he's, he's nodding. In terms of club's history and in terms of the statistics, he was permanent oh, manager. Was oh, that's wrong then. No, it's not. Oh, was it you not? got it right. You got it right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. You said four. Peter Shirtliff, Bill Dearden, um, oh no, I've got that wrong! Yeah, I was going to say, it's wrong. I've got that wrong. It should be five then. Should be five. 
Craig Priest, the Tiz <laughs> Price <laughs> strikes <laughs> again. I know. We've, but do you know what? We've had a year no, of this. Do you know what? Do you know what? Do you know what? Because of the, the, the question mark surrounding that, I'm, I'm going to give it you anyway. I, I don't I'm going to give it you anyway. I never thought he was permanent manager. It'd be interesting to see what job title he was given, whether he was given interim manager yeah. or permanent manager. I'm sure he, he was made permanent manager until the end of the season, but ah, okay. with the, deb the debate that's around that, I've already balled one question up in this <laughs> series so far. <laughs> I'm going to say that I'm giving you the point, and in terms of permanent ma ha hired as a manager, not from a caretaker, I'm going to say four and give him the point. Which what, what, Cam's, Cam's on it. 2006, caretaker manager. 2008, permanent. Oh. In which case, oh. in which case, <sighs> incorrect. I'm, I, I mean, I, I, I feel bad now. I'm no, no. the question wrong. <laughs> um, Cam's gone down the definitive route. He's had a look. He's the researcher. He's the producer on this this no, series. So th this controversial moment, which could play a key part in the end of the season, is down to Nathan and Simon. I don't. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> What's this all about? Cam saying he was a permanent manager. In which case, I got the question wrong. But um, you said four in your answer anyway, didn't you? Technically, yeah. if you got the question wrong, I was meant to get the right, question right. Can you think right, of another so question therefore. now, quickly? And this could be the difference. We'll edit it. If you can we won't edit it. edit it. That's that's effort. <laughs> Do you know can think of a quick question now? Uh, and if he gets this question right, he can have the point. Can have the point, obviously. If not, then right. Then obviously not. Okay. Have I got to start the clock again? No, no, you don't have to start the clock again. No. No, 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 no. Time. Okay. I'm just trying to think, think back o over that time to see if I can. Uh, Give him another anagram. I can't think one off the top of my head. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Go on. Randy one. No, that's well, yeah, but, but he's got to be one he played with. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, no. right, this is this is pressure. Right, it's got to be one about your career. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, I no, go on, go on. I think it's too easy. No, to do it. Right, I'm putting it on Nathan. Your, like your question. I wish I didn't now. I think it's going to be really easy. I think I was going to know it. Doesn't matter. Much. I want but, it to be easy. Okay, so it, that's the first time I've asked a question. Yeah. This is a big moment. Come out, be it. Oh. That's the same. So, Jeff Stellin named a book. Yes. Gav Jellyman. Oh, he's got it. He's got it's it. A <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> All right. It, even though I've balls up the question, I'm giving the nine. Well done for Nathan for, uh, for rescuing it. Which means, after all of that, that JD, you scored nine, Ooh. which is the most correct answers oh, yes. so, so far. No, um, <laughs> don't just start that again. We'll be here all night. Uh, in a time of one minute thirty-eight, which is what oh, Mickey Bolding did it in with penalties, <laughs> which means with penalties you got it in one minute forty-three. But because you got the most correct answers, you are at the top of the leaderboard. I'll take that. So I'll it's, take it's that. the rules stipulate, and it has done since episode one. Before mm. any of you start piping up in the comments, <laughs> um, that it's the person who's got the most correct answers and then the quickest time. So you're first. Does, does that in include the us in the comments? Yes, <laughs> I am. I am disappointed in the Ebbs Fleet question, though. I, I yeah. You'd believe. have got ten out of ten. That I cannot believe because I was. I was thinking that the first game was a home game, and I know Kidderminster was one of the early home games that we. I think uh, Kidderminster was the first home I game. I'm not winning. Wrong. I have been already tonight, tonight, so. But yeah, I should have known the Ebbs Fleet game because it was a really tough game. Rad, so yeah, it's a really <laughs> tough game. That. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do you remember from that? And that's it's a, probably a good time to start the second half. Really, yeah. let's talk about uh, the club's relegation. We'll talk about the relegation season um, in a minute, but let's focus on the start of the conference. Obviously, yeah. <sighs> Mickey Bolding told us a story last week. Mm. Paul Holland was the manager. We went down, yeah. um, and he took training for the at least the yeah. first couple of sessions. What happened? Well, we the lads were all assembled. We hadn't. We hadn't signed contracts as such yet, but we were told that like it was just a matter of time um, before we all signed. Like Paul Holland, he did, he'd agreed figures with people, um, and like you said, he took the first couple of training sessions. And then I remember coming in one day, and he wasn't there. And um, Andy Saunders, Andy Perry, and I think it was Steve Middleton, I think, um, came in the changing room and like, oh, we've we've relieved Paul of his duties. Um, and there's going to be a new manager, but at the same time, Paul Paul was still around. I don't think he took the news too well, and um, 
there was one one tail that he wouldn't he wouldn't leave the ground so he had to be convinced to actually leave the premises after being relieved of his duty um, and as lads we were a bit gutted because I know like me for one I had turned down contracts at other places because I wanted to stay at Mansfield and I know that was the case for other people and um, for all we knew if we then rang those clubs back up we wouldn't have been able to go there they might have filled the place with somebody else so it was it was disappointing it was disappointing to be honest and we all liked Dutch Dutch was a character he, he made you feel comfortable he made you laugh and he knew his football um, so it was just a bizarre situation and I sort of well, for one of the few times I sort of lost lost my temper a little bit and I just went straight upstairs to the guys Andy Saunders who coincidentally is my, my chairman now and I think it was Andy Perry who I asked at the time I said is there any point in me staying um, is there any point in me waiting to see what's happening and and they were like yeah you're one of the people that we want at the club so having heard that I thought I'll stick around I'll stick around for a bit and then uh, Billy McEwen came and and obviously I did end up end up signing um, so I, I am I am happy that I did go and speak to them and ask if they wanted me because if that was the case I would have gone and I think um, it was Macclesfield at the time that I was um, I was close to going to who were who were they were still in they were still in the football league so um, I did turn down the opportunity to stay in the football league just to just to stay at Stags. No, I understand if you don't want to answer this next ah, question, right. but mm. is it true you took a pay cut? I took a massive a massive pay cut and I think it. Um, worked out about 45% of my wages so uh, like obviously we, when we were doing well at the time and coming from Man City I, I, I was on quite a good contract um, but I knew that the club would have financial constraints in the in the um, in the conference so I sort of worked out what I could afford to keep my house going and everything and yeah I took I took quite a big quite a big pay cut I know there was other people that would have would have like considered doing the same but yeah I, I took a took a pay cut to stay. You see that now, this day and age, would you? Would well, no, I think it's diff. These days, I do think people follow the money without thinking of your enjoyment and and sort of your history with the club. And I do understand it in one way because if if you're offered a promotion at work away from football, you would most probably take it. Like, and in, if it came with a financial incentive, but. Football's different. Like you, you do, you do have to be happy where you are with what you're doing. You have to enjoy the club, and and for me that was paramount. So as long as I had enough money to pay my bills, keep my house going, and everything, I wanted to keep doing what I enjoy doing, which was playing football. So yeah, I know that there was myself and a few others that were prepared to take a pay cut to stay at the club. How difficult was that scenario? Because obviously you've gone from a, a coach who you've respected and you've worked with yeah. for years because he was there when you first exactly. signed as yeah, because I think he was shirtlift assistant. He was assistant, yeah. And it had been all, all the way through. Yeah. Um, and then McEwen comes in and then I remember this pre-season friendly, I think it's Hucknall away, where it was just a complete oh. team of trialists. Yeah. What was that like? Did they, was it literally a thing of they turn up on the day, or had you trained a couple of days before? We, we had trained a couple of days before, but it was still the people that were turning up on the day hadn't trained, so it was a strange scenario. I'd never been in one before, like as a professional player. It was just like a sort of mix and match. It was like, right, put the shirt on, you're on trial, basically. Now, luckily for me, I'd, I'd sort of been told that I would be getting a contract anyway, so that sort of took the pressure off me a little bit. But for some other players, they did not perform to their the best ability because they were probably just nervous thinking what's going on and he was quite an intense guy as well Billy McEwen um, so not everybody took to him um, I think I remember Jake Buxton he did not take to him at all and it actually turned out for him probably best leaving Stags because he went on to have a, a good career but I think if Dutch would have stayed then Bucco, Bucco would have been a Stags player um, but yeah it, it was strange Billy McEwen did take he did take some warming to, but in the end, um, I, I actually did did warm to him, and and again, he believed in me as a player. And although his methods were a bit old school, I understood his reasoning for them. Um, and I suppose as a player, you just need to abide by the manager's wishes, because whether you like him or not, he's the one who picks the team and makes makes the decisions. Why wasn't it working under Billy McEwen? What didn't um, what didn't go right? I think he was stubborn. And I think the players could see that. If, if something needed changing, he, he wasn't very pragmatic at all. Um, he had his methods, like I was saying earlier, we, we trained for about three hours. Now, obviously now I've got a normal job where I work all day, three hours is nothing. But but as a footballer, if, if you said to any 
any professional footballer, right, you're gonna train this morning for three hours, they would not believe you. Like, you, you do an hour and a half maybe tops, um, but with Billy McEwen, the warm up alone would be for an hour. Um, then we do some training, then we do like a uh, upper body session in the afternoon. And I understood his methods, but he was, he was very old school. He's very old school. And even with the team lineup and the way that we played, he didn't really adapt it enough. Um, and the start of that season when we got relegated, it actually worked. Because I think after 10 games, I think we were, we were either top or we were near the top. Um, but then it just all started going downhill. Like teams knew what we were doing. They knew what we'd turn up and do every week. And, and obviously Mansfield being a big club in the conference, even now at AFC Mansfield, when I go and play against a big club, you raise your game. So people were coming to Field Mill and raising their game to play against a big club. Um, so it just it just didn't work. His sort of reluctance to change didn't really work. And I think he lost he lost a lot of the fans as well. Um, but I, I I did understand. I understood what he was trying to do. Um, and he was he was one at the end when he lost his job. He held his hands up and just said it wasn't working. The club had made the right decision, so that was it. I'm struggling to remember who his coaching staff were because Paul Holland had been there for a long time and served as assistant and coach. So I'm struggling to remember if he either a did actually bring coaching staff in with him or b did or Do you know who they were. I'm I'm with you on that one. I don't I don't think he had. The only really name I've got in my head is Neil Richardson, but I'm thinking that's that was that that's was, way before. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, he he was even if he did have an assistant, he didn't need one because he took training. He did everything. He that's took, why I'm thinking he didn't do yeah. it. He didn't have one because he was. He decided what drills to do. Whereas before, I don't know. It might be Dutch as the assistant might do the warm up and the main body of the session, and then the tactical element. The manager will come in. Whereas. Billy McEwen did everything from the warm up to everything. He pumped up the balls and, and everything. He was completely in control, which in one way, at least he knows his message is getting across. But in another way, at times you sort of need that little bit of a break from, um, from, that, from his intensity. And like I said, not every player, not every player um, it didn't sit well with. Did so. it go sour in the dressing room where they fall out? Um, there weren't fallouts to his face because he, he was the type of guy who you probably wouldn't say, listen, I don't agree with what you're doing. He strikes me as the type of the guy that would probably pin you up against the wall yeah. and, and he, get physical. Yeah, he was one of those. But I think when he went out of the changing room, that's when the talk would start. And a lot of the time that's not good because it's sort of him against us type of scenario. Um, and you don't need that in a changing room. You need to, you need to be united. Like, yeah, you're not going to always agree with the manager, but it can't be a case of everyone being down when he walks into the room. And unfortunately, it did get to that towards the end of his time. So I think the club the club did the right thing in the end to relieve him of his duties when he did. It's interesting to hear that about that sort of area because that was the start of the conference years. It wasn't, you know, really one which we sort of remember. All I remember from, from that was Ed Fleet away as supporters, pulling up on the coach outside and seeing this overgrown sort of ground, run down ground. It said, welcome to the welcome to the conference on, on the outside. We walked in the ground and growing up between the terrace there was weeds and plants <laughs> going through the terraces. Not only that, I mean, I remember when, when I pulled up, I was going in the car with my dad, we had a, we had a car full as we've always done when we're going away and uh, we, where we parked up here we were literally just outside the ground I think it was like there's a stand on the side and there's like a little car park there and right there on the side of the sand it said no ball games well <laughs> we thought well we're going to go we're going to do well here then aren't we <laughs> there's no ball games but it's just it was a shock to the system wasn't it when we've uh, followed followed the club for so many years um, and then we, we turned up at Edfrey. I think that's where you really realise where you were mm. a bit like Chesterfield are going to realise next season you know so uh, <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable wasn't it to be honest but um, they've done well though the club because there's teams who get relegated to the conference look at Stockport County and then mm. they might even get relegated again like Stockport now playing in the conference north so Darlington as well Darlington as well, as well. Yeah. they're in the conference they're in the, conf they're in the well. conference yeah. north so I do the club obviously I wasn't there when they got promoted back up but I was really happy for them because at one point I was worried that Mansfield Town are going to be a non-league club for a long time. It's funny that you mentioned mm. that. That's it. Yeah. it. It's funny that you mentioned that because obviously we'll talk a little bit more about your departure in a minute um, but 
you went on to North, which had a few spells elsewhere. Yeah. Ended up at Eastwood with mm. Paul Cox, who obviously got Mansfield promoted. Yeah. And there was brief talk of you a return. Yeah, yeah, I did have a really good season um, just before Cox came to uh, to Stags, and there's myself, Lyndon, Michael, Lee Stevenson, and Matt Reed, and we all had sort of an initial chat with Paul Cox about possibly joining him at his new club, um, Stags. Did you know where it was when he said he was talking about a new club? The very club? first time he mentioned it, we didn't, but but then um, later on we did find out it was Stags, so obviously all of us were waiting waiting by the phone, and, and for myself, for whatever reason, the call didn't come, and, and I look back on that now, and in a way I am pleased, because it, it did allow me to go down um, sort of the academic teaching route um, that I'm in at the minute. Uh, well, I would have loved another shot at Stags, uh, and it probably would have just delayed my progression into teaching, but I do think it probably was the right thing for me, um, for it not to happen. Did you, obviously you hold a high affinity for Mansfield, I know that you'd love to get back and watch games, yeah. obviously pre playing for AFC prevents that a little yeah. bit, um, and I get the feeling that if you weren't playing you'd probably be a season ticket holder with us, we'd actually, we'd, <laughs> you'd be a Mansfield Matters podcast panellist. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when you knew that it was Mansfield, and you, obviously taking the, the phone call aspect of it and you might be going back aside, yeah. did you ever think actually this might be the time that Mansfield might return? Did you ever think that Cox was capable of doing that or did you question um, it? Because he did have success at Eastwood. So. He did have success. Now, he, know, he knows how to win and it's not always an attractive style of football. Um, as long as you win, you, well, it doesn't exactly. matter. Does if I'm honest, I didn't, think, I didn't think he'd managed to get the club promoted. I thought he'd do well. Um, when I saw the likes of Reedy sign, I thought, oh, I'm not sure if the Stags fans are going to sort of buy into this. Because at times at Eastwood, we were very, very direct. We'd get the ball forward, hit it to Reed it, scrap off the seconds, and then Lee Stevenson had just <laughs> smashed one in from 30 yards. And I know he did have some good times at Mansfield, but I actually thought he would do better than, than he did. Because um, at, at Eastwood Town, I know there's a difference in level, but at Eastwood Town, he was unreal. He was unbelievable. He was scoring from all angles. Um, but yeah. Cox, he knows how to win, but I didn't believe that he would get the club as far as he did. Uh, but fair play to him, he knew what he needed to do when he got there. He just found that winning formula, direct to, to Reed, flick it onto Green and jobs are good. And, exactly. and then Lee Stevenson popping up just behind yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, well. No, it's no coincidence that Lee Stevenson finished that season as second top goal scorer, is it? So, no. get bearing in mind his Eastwood pass. Let's go back then uh, to when you were there. We were talk we spoke about Billy McEwen. Yeah. Uh, he left. Yeah. Aidy Moses and Mark Stellar were put in caretaker yeah. charge. I remember that. It was Boxing Day, Kettering away, one of the probably the best victories of, of that season. Yeah. What were they two? What were they like? Did you, did you think? Really, really nice. Like, at the time, we all wanted them to get the job, but they had no managerial experience. The club in that in the conference was a big club that needed really to push up the league. So I understand why they didn't get the job. Um, but yeah, they took over for a bit, and and we did well. We did well. So I don't know. Could they have a little? Could they had have had a little bit longer in the job? Um, maybe. Um, but I remember the day the day that AD found out that um, they weren't getting the job. He, he came to me at training and was like, "Oh, John, I'm like we're gutted." Um, I was like, "Why?" And he said, "Oh." because they've told us who the new manager is and um, they were like, oh it's David Holdsworth and I'd heard of Dean Holdsworth but I actually hadn't heard of David Holdsworth to be honest. AKA the lesser twin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd, I didn't know anything about him uh, but then I did a bit of research and I heard he was at Ilkeston and did alright at Ilkeston but I thought it is quite a big step up to go from Ilkeston who are quite, quite a small club really to Mansfield Town who in the area, especially at non-league level. And at that particular time as well, it was still our first season and then we wanted to bounce straight back. Exactly. I thought, I can't remember who it was, but there were some more established names that were sort of floated around at the time. Um, and we were all really surprised as lads. Um, and then I remember the first time we saw him, he was like in expensive, slick clothing. And yeah, you shouldn't judge a book by his cover, but he he... He just seemed a little bit arrogant and a little bit sure of himself and and I hate to talk badly about people but it, it did actually come to fruition like that first initial judgment. Um, I always give people a chance and I did. I gave him a chance. He was he was he was strangely good to me at the start of his time. Um, he made me captain and gave me a new deal, having seen me play once and 
I'm not saying there was, but I don't know if there was an agenda behind that. Like maybe it was to win, win over some of the fans or, or something. There might have been some form of agenda. Um, well, with long serving players, managers tend to go one or two ways, don't they? Either put yeah. them on the transfer list and get rid to start new, or they make him captain and well, give them a new deal. He did both, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> because yeah, he, he made he made me captain, gave me a new deal. He used to butter me up in in like um, in training and things. Um, did well for 10 games and I think it was Wrexham away we, we got beat and we, we didn't play well at all like I didn't play well but it was my first game as captain where I didn't play well and after that game wasn't on the bench anything I went from captain who we spoke to all the time to not even being on the bench not even talking to me and, and uh, I know we were saying earlier when when a manager doesn't fancy it's easy to resent the manager but you do expect some form of explanation there was another there was another 10 players on the pitch that time who did no better than me yet they all played the next game and to not even be on the bench the next game um, it was a shock and after must have been about a couple of months of just coming to games sitting in the stands um, he actually for the first time he spoke to me and said oh Northwich Victoria uh, have come in and they they want you to go on loan and at that time I was really thinking about this teaching route, I'd, I'd finished my degree but I had no actual experience in schools because obviously I was at Mansfield Town full time and I thought this might actually be good for my sort of future career if I drop to part time football at Northwich and get into schools but I've got to say Northwich only made my appetite for football even stronger, I really enjoyed it there and I think it, again the managers make a difference. A manager at the time, Andy Preece, and his assistant Andy Morrison, who, who was a Man City legend, um, they made me feel really welcome and we went on an unbelievable FA Cup run. Um, we beat Charlton, who were top of League One at the time, and then we just got beat by Lincoln. Um, really enjoyed my time at Northwich. Um, and then when that loan ran out, I went back to Mansfield and David Olsworth said, if you can sign for Northwich, if I were you, I'd go. And I thought, yeah, that's that's my decision made. Like, if you don't want me to stay and and prove that I should be playing, because although I, I am quite modest, I do think I, I had the ability to be playing in that Mansfield Town team. So if the manager's saying that I haven't, then there's not really much point in me staying, um, especially if I've got another potential career down the line. And I enjoyed it at Northwich. I thought, right, that's it. Back to Manchester it is, um, for, to Northwich for a bit. Mm, it's, it's an interesting time because David Holdsworth was synonymous with getting rid of the front door at the one course stadium and putting in a turnstile, a revolving door. Yeah. The, uh, the overturn of players was just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And From the outside anyway, was it the same on the inside? It was the same, yeah. We'd, we'd, you'd come in each week thinking, oh, what was like? And it's a horrible thing, when someone walks in, the first thing you think is, what position's he? Like, am I not going to be on the bench? Am I not, am I not going to be starting? And it was a case of every other week there was someone new. Like, like I said, um, when I had a bad game, he kept the same team except for me, but a couple of weeks down the line, as soon as you played bad, that was it. You weren't gone, as in you weren't released, but somebody else was in. And that doesn't work in football. You, you are going to have an off game. Like, obviously, the best players in the world will probably be very consistent, but apart from that, you know, people will have off games. You see people like Harry Kane having an off game, so if he can have an off game and still play next week, then surely, surely someone else can. Um, but he just seemed to have the philosophy at the time, I need results now, so if you're not doing it in this game, I'm going to get someone else who is. And there was no guarantee that that person was. So it was strange. It, it was a revolving door and, it, and he, he didn't really speak to the players with the, res, the level of respect that they probably should have got. Like I remember him saying to Aidy Moses, who was the captain before I was made captain, he just said to him <laughs> with his, in, after his first training session, oh Aidy, I'm, I'm making JD captain because he's going to be here next year. And Aidy just looked into that and thought, oh, <laughs> right, that obviously means that I'm not going to be here next year. Like no contracts or anything have been discussed yet, but just to say that to him for his, on the first session, and then pick Ada the next week. I don't know where Ada's head, head was at. He's, he's professional though, so Ada will just get on with it. But for someone to say that to you and then pick you, it makes you think, God, do I even want to play for someone who's more or less just said, I'm not going to be there? You just looked at me, Si, as if to say, I didn't really believe your stories before, but now I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just can't believe that, can you, really? It's, 
Mm. It's just something that you don't do. And then, then to pick him next game, exactly. you'd be like... He was, our best, he was one of our best players that he, season, Ada. He, he, did, he was really consistent. Yeah. Yeah, his pace was never never that good at that time of his career, but he played really well. His defending like, was quite decent. Yeah, for Holdsworth yeah. to literally say to him on his first first session, our oh, JD's captain, because he's going to be here next season, that it would take yeah. me back, I'd, definitely. To be fair, I'd be like, you can have shit, yeah. I'm yeah. going. Yeah, see you later. I want um, to go there and then. Yeah, Aidy's a top class professional, obviously played at the highest level, played in the Premiership, so he just took it in his stride. We, we'd have loved to have seen Aidy Moses stay, I think, wouldn't we? I think he was, uh, of that a very disappointing yeah. season really because we all wanted to go up and it just didn't happen with everything off the pitch and, and things like that it didn't seem to get any better AD Moses was shining and we all felt and I guess it was the same for you Nath as well that he could you know go on to be a bit of a, a club legend if he'd have stayed yeah I, it was, it's difficult isn't it like you look at that year and like there was so much change in, in the club sort of on the pitch and obviously off the pitch so it was a massive transition and obviously we had some some quality players in that some in, not in that so team. Players. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. but, you, but you know, it's uh, you, you know, we had a lot of players like you know, like the Bucko as well. The yeah. players that have gone on to do so well, and the players that have already done so well. So, but it's just hard, isn't it, when you come down into 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 the conference and there's so much changing. It's it's not it's not the environment you need for a football club, is it really? So. That instability it had to sort of stabilise some point, which mm. took longer than what we what we hoped for, really. And when you look back at that as well, when Holds was appointed, the January transfer window, he completely like cleared out half the squad and yeah. brought in new players. I think the only two which sort of ends up staying long long term, Alan Marriott and Louis Briscoe. Yeah, yeah. Well, both good lads, really. Alan Marriott. I, I know. I know. We, his age was against him, but I still think he retired way too early. Yeah. Well, he was the story behind that was he was. I, I think I'm right in saying he was offered a new deal and then it was withdrawn. And oh, I think well. he would have still been playing for us now. Yeah, he's a re- really good goalkeeper. I remember playing against him, thinking he's brilliant. Then when we signed him, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so yeah, I think he was one of Holdsworth's better signings if, if it was Holdsworth that signed him. Um, I think it was over I mean, hundred. He made that many signings. He's got to get some right. Yeah, he must have got yeah. some right. <laughs> yeah, but. It's just not a way to run a football club, really. Um, that many ins and outs. You're never going to get stability, and you didn't really get the results either. So it just didn't work. I mean, what was that song that you bring the player in, the player out, in, out, in, out? It's a club about. That was probably one of my favourite songs yeah. that I've ever sang to. Me. It's been so relevant as well. Yeah, it certainly was. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, briefly about your exit, as you say, North, North which came calling. Yeah. It, did that look, leave a bit of a, a bit of taste? Because obviously, you had. It must have been such a tough decision for you because you'd been at the club for so yeah. so long. You were so close to a testimonial as well. Mm-hmm. Well, if the thing is, if if a different manager would have been there at the time, I I may have like do you know was like still been at, at Stags now. Um, Holdsworth made my decision to leave easier. He made it very easy. The way he was as a person and the way he was with other players, not just myself. It made my decision to leave easy, and I suppose. <coughs> I wouldn't say I've fallen out of love with football, but I wasn't as enthusiastic about it anymore. I wanted to do well for the club, but it's hard when the person at the top of the club was the way that he was. And like I said, I don't really like to talk badly about a manager, but but he was one of my least favourite, let's just put it that way. If you were to be stuck in a lift with yeah. three people that you, you've not got on with in football, yeah. who would they be? Holdsworth. You hate to be stuck in a lift with. David Holdsworth, Joey Barton, Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, who else can we have? Do you know what? I'd probably stop there. Hmm. Um, yeah, they're probably the only two people who, in football, I've developed a genuine dislike for. I, I'm not a rude person, so if I saw him there, I'd probably go up to him and shake his hand and have a conversation with him. But, but as a manager and a person at that time, like I did lose a lot of respect for him. Joey Barton, we've got to ask. Well, Joey Barton was a strange one at Man City because he came through the youth ranks, so he knew what it was like to come through the youth ranks and make it into the first team. Now, Joey, Joey's about three or four years older than me. Um, so when myself, my brother, um, Nada Manua, who's at QPR at the minute, and Stephen Ireland, sort of that generation of players, when we were coming through the ranks, he made life an absolute misery for us. Like, 
and I just don't understand why. I don't understand why somebody who's been through sort of the transition from youth team football to senior football would make your life a living hell. What like, sort of things would he do to... He would like, if you were, if you were like doing a little bit of passing or something before training, I remember once he got, um, he got one of the players' balls and he just kicked it right down the other end of the field. And, and then he'd say, he'd run to Kevin Keegan and go, look what the young lads have done, smashing the balls everywhere. And as a young lad, you're like, if Kevin Keegan tells you to go and fetch a ball, you're going to fetch a ball. Um, but then there's other stories with Joey, even when, even when he laid off the young lads a bit, there was a player at City, um, Usman Darbo, uh, a French lad, and Joey used to smash everyone in training. He was a really aggressive uh, tackler. And Darbo, who played centre mid as well, he didn't like it. So one day, Darbo got him back, fair tackle, got him back, and as Darbo was walking away, Joey's hit him back of his head, knocked him out, kicked him in his face, and like, if you search online for the pictures of Darbo after the incident with Joey Barton, his face was an absolute mess. So, like, Joey Barton definitely, for more than one reason, is somebody who, who, I, who I didn't like at football. I've got to say, he's winning me over a little bit in terms of listening to his punditry, because he's very honest. Um, I like types of him and Robbie Savage, they're very honest in the pundit tread, but as, his, as a person and as a footballer back then, no, didn't like him at all. And Fleetwood in for an interesting ride then this season. Well, yeah, unless he has calmed down a bit, which I think he must have done. I think he must have done because I would not give a, I would not give a manager job to somebody like that unless he's changed quite a bit. So Did anyone in the Stags ranks ever come close to being on the list? Was there anyone who you thought you need to sort yourself out a little bit? Or uh, do you know what? No, we always had a good group of, of lads, and no matter the changes in terms of the managers, the sort of mentality in the dressing room was was always that we're in this together. So there might have been people who who probably thought a little bit too much of themselves, but no, there was no one who who were genuine, genuinely would dislike and think. Do you know what? I don't want to play with you. Like, I don't even want to be in the same room as you. So no, no, there wasn't. Everybody sort of had the shared mentality of let's do this for the club. And obviously, I'm speaking from the outside looking in. I don't know whether the club have got that now. I don't know if they've got a group of players that want to achieve for the club. If they do, then looking at the pedigree of some of the players, then they should get the club up, up the football league and into League One. But you have to want it. Yeah, it has to actually mean something to you like that's why a lot of a lot of the lads that did well when i was there they they either lived close to the area or actually in mansfield they knew what it meant to mm. the fans but when you've got people traveling from all over the place it is essentially just a job mm. and and that's where that's where there's a bit of a difference who in the changing room would be the victim of the the hammer from the banter from lads i mean one uh, person springs to mind um yeah it being Johnny Mullins. Yeah, Johnny Mullins. Oh, bless him. I've got him on Facebook, so we might actually see this. Is <laughs> is uh, uh, I think his well, not I think his sister did a bit of modelling, and I think even venturing into the glamour model industry. Uh, and when lads caught wind of it and used to bring photos of her in into the changing rooms, he would get a lot of stick. To be fair to him, he took it well. He took it like a soldier. Um, so. He would get a lot of stick, and he's such a nice guy as well. So he wouldn't get it from me. I, I might observe and have a little chuckle in the corner, but, <laughs> but I wouldn't actually um, join in myself. But he's a really nice lad and a really good player. He was one when we did go down. I was devastated to see go, uh, but I knew we he, I, I knew he should have gone because he had a great season. He, he was great... too good for League Two, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. fact that we signed him from non-League, like fair play to him for working his way up and. I think it's only recently I saw, I think he signed for Cheltenham or, or yeah, not so yes, yeah. Um So he's still doing the business now at, at 32, he's the same age as me. And there is a current connection between Johnny Mullins and the current Mansfield Town side. I yeah, believe, yeah. As far which we didn't know. No, yeah, no, Johnny's um, sister uh, has got a child with um, Jacob Mellis. I, I believe they are still together. Um, but yeah, they, I know they've had a relationship and, um, and they've, they've had a child together. So there is, a still, there is still a connection. Um, <laughs> Must be strange actually, because when when they play, well, I guess they 
wouldn't might have played against each other last season when um, when Johnny was at Luton. But yeah, yeah, there is a connection connection with Stags. It's so. interesting. See yeah. all these connections, all these dots yeah, yeah. tie yeah. back down. They always yeah. come back. Well, it's been an absolutely fantastic trip uh, down memory lane tonight. If you've enjoyed it, make sure you click on that donate button. All the links that you need are in the description. So make sure you get on that. Simon and Nathan, it's been fantastic. We've been looking forward to this one for weeks and weeks and weeks now because we've when we sort of talk about which players we want on we always talk about those who have served the club over a long period of time and who've made that in, that sort of impact consistently some players can serve the club for two three seasons and have one good season with JD it's always been a consistent performance so it's been really interesting to hear the stories tonight hasn't it good insight to uh, to Maxwell Town and um, again another different perspective from like the other three that we've had on as well so it's been really interesting for me yeah um, I'd echo that as well I mean uh, obviously I've known about you as a as a player um, but not really much off the pitch really so it's the first time and it's, you know, it's been really great to hear about you know I think the journey into what you do now because I think a lot of players don't tend to in their career, they don't really think about the future. They sort of live in the here and now. And uh, I think you had, you know, some decisions to make there. And uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to hear that from a player. But again, as fans, you don't always think about what those players are going through as individuals and what they have to consider. So um, again, like I say it's a massive insight, and uh, like I say, different to the few players because uh, obviously John um, played for us in the in the conference as well. So we sat. You know, understanding that transition a little bit more so uh, no yeah it's been really great thank you very much yeah. and if you had the opportunity if uh, the phone rang it's Rudy Funk <laughs> hello it's Rudy <laughs> come on to you guys Rudy um, and he says I've had an offer for you from, uh, from John Radford uh, one year at Mansfield and uh, they say you can play on a part time contract and you can still teach two three days a week what do you do I take it. I think um, I take a full time contract. And now, now I'm a qualified maths teacher. And no one's going to take that away from me. So, yeah, if I wanted to venture into football, I would do and still go back into teaching. But I think Mansfield Town are, well, is one of the only clubs where it's not going to happen. But if I got an offer to go into full time football, I would seriously give it some consideration. I, I, I love my time at the club, and I think the club has sort of made me into the person that I am. Like not just the sort of player that that I still am. Playing at AFC Mansfield, but but I've enjoyed my time at the club, like with the fans, with the likes of yourselves, like behind the scenes, like with working around the club. Um, it's it's just not been nothing but a pleasure, really. And and yeah, I do think my time there probably ended sooner than it prob perhaps could have done. But um, I don't regret any decisions I made, and and especially the day that I came, I came on loan. It was a really good day. You get granted a testimonial. I know you've, you weren't yeah. there for the full ten years. Yeah. Put you on the spot a little bit. Yeah. Which players would you pick for the for the JD Mansfield Town Eleven? Who would you have on your your team from all of your time at Stags. playing at Stags? I'd have Jason White in goal. He'll kill me if I don't say him because I still play with AFC <laughs> Mansfield. And and I, I actually think we need to get ten pounds for everybody in here. Yes, yes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, right. yeah. Back it up. I'll get I'll get on to Whitey. He'll um, he'll, he'll donate. Um, because I do think on his day, White, he was a really good keeper. Um, left back, Gareth Jellyman. I thought he was Mr. Stedder at, at, um, at Mansfield. Right back, definitely Johnny Mullins. Um, class, different class. Centre back's got to be Bucko and Bap. Although I did like the Iceman, John Helder, um, at one point, but Bucko and Bap. Do I pick myself or not? Yeah, no, you're the captain. Oh, you're right, the captain. okay. You're the skipper. Myself and Giles Coke, definitely central midfield. Um, I'd actually go for Nathan Arnold on the right hand side. Um, Not Mickey Bowling, that one. No. <laughs> you say no. Arnold, I'm <laughs> trying to think on the left hand side. Probably someone who he was a bit hit and miss, but I did enjoy playing with him. Adam Rundle on the left hand side. <laughs> and then up front, I'd go, I'd have to go with Mickey and Richie Barker just for the just for the pure goals that they that they would um, give. And if it's ten pound for every person I mention, I need to mention Robin Homer from school and her family. They can be they can be on the subs bench, all of them. <laughs> Who's your manager? Uh, oh. Who do you pick as manager? It's got to be Peter Shirley because he brought me to the club, and and without him showing the belief in me, like I, I wouldn't have had the career that I've had. And who uh, gets chucked in the shower in the ice bath and locked in locked in there and not allowed to be a part of it? Um, 
David Ole's a fucking. Not invited. Not invited. Yeah, he'll, have to, he'll have to take the vaccine. It's, it's him. I'll save that for him. Fantastic. Well, it's been a, a great insight. I know that we'd love to see that. Yeah. Love to see that game happen. How many of those are you in contact with on a regular basis? Uh, Charles Coke. Speak to Bucko. Speak to Bap. Um, occasionally speak to Mickey, but not that often. Um, uh, Nathan Arnold. Yeah, speak to Nathan Arnold. Um, and that's about it really. Oh, Johnny Mullins, yeah. So there is there is a fair few that I still still have contact with and we all talk about the good times that we had at, at the club. I'm sensing so. a, a possible charity team here. Yeah. 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 A good side, a good side. Yeah. It would be a great side, wouldn't <laughs> it? Side. That's <laughs> it, why not? And we'll, we'll play, and the only condition is we'll play 45 minutes, uh, like we'll play 45 normal football it's and then we'll play 45 blind, blind football. Yeah, yeah. yeah, job done. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thanks as ever to uh, producer Cam who's been behind the scenes doing all the audio desk and the camera work uh, tonight. Many thanks uh, to him. Great to have him uh, back on board. Um, also, uh, thanks to Nathan and to Simon as well for their involvement tonight. Thanks very much to the Capo Lounge on Stockwell Gate in Mansfield. They all have some fantastic f- facilities. Can't get my words out again. It's happening again. <laughs> fantastic facilities up here. You can stop laughing behind the camera as you're walking out. Um, so if you are around Mansfield and you want a coffee, come down here, come upstairs and sit in this very room and have a coffee and have a chat of where we film uh, these uh, shows. Thanks very much to Guide Dog Hudson who's down there been sleeping away at JD's feet all, all evening. Uh, and thanks very much of, of course to you watching at home. If you've enjoyed it, please do donate as always. It's a fantastic cause is the Alzheimer's Society. We'll be back again same time next week for yet another um, trip down memory lane. But as always, let's end with the last word going to tonight's guest JD thanks guys for having me it's been an absolute pleasure I always love talking about football especially my time at Mansfield Town and it is a worthy cause like anything I can do if you need me to put you in touch with anyone or anything like that I'll, I'll definitely do I'll definitely do my bit I encourage, encourage people to donate because as we said it's all for a good cause and we get to talk about football as well so thank you very much